Good evening. Good evening. Um, certainly, as a Holy Cross religious, I want to add my word of welcome to you all here to our apostolate, uh, especially to those who are here for the first time. Um, it is a joy for me to introduce our speaker tonight, who is a, a wonderful scholar and also a, a good friend. Um, Professor O'Callaghan grew up in Wisconsin and attended St. Norbert's College, which means that when he's not thinking about Aquinas, he is pontificating about the Packers and uh, outdoor grilling. He has lots of opinions about that. He received his PhD in philosophy here at Notre Dame in 1996, and in 98 joined the faculty at Creighton University, and then was on the faculty of the University of Portland in Oregon, which is also a Holy Cross uh, ministry. In 2003, he returned to his alma mater here at Notre Dame as an associate professor. And since 2006, he has served as the director of the Jacques Maritain Center, succeeding his teacher and mentor, the late Ralph McInerney. Dr. O'Callaghan recently served as the president of the American Catholic Philosophical Association, and he serves as a permanent member of the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas, at whose meetings he normally stays at the Hotel Santa Marta in the Vatican, but a certain famous resident there has forced the members of the academy to find different lodging. <laughs> I hear the papal apartments are available. <laughs> He has written several articles uh, and books in the area of Thomistic studies, including Thomistic Realism and the Linguistic Turn, and co-edited the book Recovering Nature, Essays in Honor of Ralph McInerney. He and his wife, Dr. Mary O'Callaghan, are raising five children, and they just celebrated yesterday their 23rd anniversary of marriage. So congratulations. If you're looking for a late Father's Day or anniversary gift, he prefers mild cigars and strong rye whiskey. <laughs> the problem is that they're usually my cigars and my whiskey. <laughs> His most recent study investigates the place of misericordia in the thought of St. Aquinas. And tonight he will address us with the topic of healing and culture. Please welcome Dr. John O'Callaghan. Well, thank you uh, very much, Father. Um, two corrections. Um, in his um, generosity, uh, although it may not be generosity, it may just be facts, uh, caught up with them, um, it, they really can't use that hotel just for the Pope. So uh, we're back in there this year. Uh, so I'm off, to the, I'm off to that meeting, otherwise known as PASTA. The Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, I'm off to that on Wednesday, and I will uh, try to get up for 7 o'clock Mass. Um, and the other is that, of course, uh, the reason why I smoke uh, Father Wirtz's cigars and drink his whiskey is he's got the best on campus. <laughs> well, so... Uh, one thing that strikes me, by the way, with these images is uh, it's striking how the quality of displays uh, is different. Um, I would say, having seen that just last year um, in the Netherlands, the best rendering is the one over there in terms of, of Van Gogh's vibrant colors. So, he approached the victim, poured oil and wine over his wounds, and bandaged them. Then he lifted him up on his own animal, took him to an inn and cared for him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper with the instruction, take care of him. If you spend more than what I have given you, I shall repay you on my way back. Which of these, in your opinion, was neighbor to the robber's victim? He answered, the one who treated him with misericordia. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Thank you. I'm very grateful to the Institute for Church Life, John Cavadini, the Notre Dame Center for Liturgy, and particularly Tim O'Malley, for asking me to address you this evening on culture and healing as part of the Liturgy and he as Healing Conference. That said, I'm not exactly sure why I've been invited to address you. 
I'm not a theologian. In the mouths of some, that claim might appear to be just bragging. <laughs> but in my case, it's a true confession of ignorance. By and large, the theology I know has been by assimilation rather than study. Nor am I a liturgist. Again, by saying that I am no, by saying that I'm no liturgist, I'm not trying to assure you that you have no reason to fear me. You all probably know many more jokes about the tyranny of liturgists than I do, tyrants as you are, so I won't repeat any here. I tried one on Father Wirtz the other day, and he said the 80s called, they want their joke back. <laughs> My experience of liturgy is firmly in the camp of those who participate in the pews and occasionally read from the ambo. Other than being familiar with some of the dogmatic statements about the nature of the Mass, and occasionally trying to say the Liturgy of the Hours with my wife, but mostly failing, I haven't given much thought to Liturgy. I go to confession. I've received the anointing of the sick once, 25 years ago. I attend Mass weekly, but also weekly. Mostly, I'm probably like a lot of people in the pews, sometimes attentive, sometimes not, sometimes looking at what others are doing, sometimes not, sometimes judging, sometimes not, sometimes repenting, sometimes not, sometimes thankful, sometimes not, sometimes worshiping, sometimes not, sometimes singing, many times not. <laughs> In short, a whole lot of sometimes this or that or what have you, and sometimes not. I'm a sinner, which is why it is always good for me to be in Mass in any condition. Still, I fear I won't be able to say much of interest to you that, that all of you don't already know about liturgy. Things don't get much better when we turn our attention to healing and culture, the topic I was asked to speak about. I've mostly healed from things that have ailed me so far, but as time goes by, I find myself failing more and more at that as well. And my experience of medicine is as a consumer, like most people in our culture, looking for a product the medical industrial complex promises to sell me for a price. As Father Wirtz will, in fact, did explain to you, I am overly fond of cigars. I grill my red meat over noxious carcinogens producing, carcinogen producing charcoal. I'm part of the bourbon craze. In ages past, you would have looked upon my fine profile. <laughs> You would have looked upon my fine profile and judged me to be a prosperous man. But no one of you looking at me now in this day and age would dare to judge me a good authority on health or healing. As for culture, it's a cliche among faculty who leave Notre Dame to explain in practically weepy emails that they are leaving because of the desire for greater culture than one can find in South Bend. I once had a colleague leave for the University of Las Vegas report his desire for greater culture. <laughs> I felt like responding as Thomas More does to Richard Rich in A Man for All Seasons, but for Las Vegas. <laughs> Still, if these colleagues are right, and given the fact that I dearly love Notre Dame unabashedly, I'm probably not the most cultured of persons. So really, I'm also probably not the best person to speak to you on the central topic of your conference. And now is the time for any of you to leave if you came expecting serious theological reflection upon liturgy by a cultured and healthy speaker. So I'll pause for a moment if anyone wants, <laughs> wants to run for the doors. I can't say at Notre Dame, run for the hills. <laughs> if you want to stay, however, and listen to a mere lover of wisdom like me, I think Tim O'Malley asked me to address you because of something I said in a talk last year about the field of bioethics and prenatal testing for disabilities. After fairly extensive reading in the field for the purpose of my presentation, I said that bioethics struck me as by and large a moral wasteland, possessing little serious moral reflection upon the goods of, a medi of medical care that seeks to help those who suffer some illness or disability when possible and to extend comfort to them in all cases. I was struck by a sense in the context of prenatal diagnosis that the field by and large isn't about healing. It's about killing. As a field, it seems to be designed to manage the killing in a rational and autonomous way. It's pretty well taken for granted that if a child is diagnosed within the womb 
with a serious illness or disability, of course the child will be killed. If you think I'm being hyperbolic, just consider the recent debate in England within the medical and legislative communities about whether a diagnosis of cleft palate was a serious enough condition for the machinery of death to turn on and public financing in the National Health Service to pay for it. The key pursuit of bioethical reflection is that the killing take place as a result of the informed consent of rational, free, and autonomous agents. Much of the theorizing is about what sorts of social and medical conditions undermine the rational and free choices of the agents involved. How can pr procedures be put in place to guarantee autonomy in the choice to, do to let die or kill, and so on? Many different reasons will be given for the killing that it seeks to manage. Sometimes it will be the need to prevent the future suffering of the child herself or himself that may result from the condition identified. Sometimes it will be the need to provide the parents with the opportunity to try again and produce the healthy baby they want. In its more abstract forms, you will see arguments on behalf of the non-existent but possible future babies that the parents might be able to produce with the assistance of the doctor. The thought in such arguments is that the life of this existing child with a disability is a harm committed against the future, not yet conceived children the parents might have, either by preventing the birth of the non-existent but possible children, or by making their possible lives more difficult if they should happen to be born, as family resources will be consumed in taking care of the disabled child resources that would otherwise go to the unconceived but presumably healthy future kids. I think when I rehearsed that last year at the presentation Tim attended, the non-philosophers in the room were looking up and saying, this is what philosophy does? Sadly, yes. Can you do the next slide? In the beginning was the word. And here are some exemplary words of contemporary bioethics that are characteristic of the field. To have a child with Down syndrome is to have a very different experience from having a normal child. It can still be a warm and loving experience, but we must have lowered expectations of our child's abilities. We cannot expect a child with Down syndrome to play the guitar, to develop an appreciation of science fiction, to learn a foreign language, to chat with us about the latest Woody Allen movie, or to be a respectable athlete basketballer or tennis player. We can think of what Tim said just now about the appearance of people with Down syndrome. At first you might think from the pastoral tone of this passage that it comes from a work on how to, do, how to help people with Down syndrome and their families cope with the medical and social difficulties that often accompany the syndrome. The child is suffering a disability or illness. She needs our care. Parents are the primary caregivers of their children and the medical profession devotes itself to assisting them in that care, aiming at healing when possible, but always at ameliorating the suffering the child may experience out of a loving concern for her. So you might think such care would be a compassionate expression of the moral character of the practice of medicine, devoted to healing in our culture. But you would be wrong. The passage is taken from Princeton philosopher Peter Singer's famous book, Rethinking Life and Death. And that book isn't so much about figuring out how to help human beings cope with suffering from the medical difficulties and illnesses that often accompany conditions like Down syndrome. That is how to expand the scope of our compassionate medical care for those who suffer. On the contrary, it's an extended meditation devoted to exploring and expanding a rather different scope, the scope of those human beings who we, whom we may legitimately kill. To make that case, it focuses upon what it takes to be obvious, manifestly diminished abilities in certain paradigmatic instances of human activity. The emphasis is upon what it is thought a child with Down syndrome won't be able to achieve. And yet it forms a crucial moment in Singer's narrative account of why parents of children with Down syndrome and several other conditions besides ought to be allowed to let them die after birth Indeed, that it ought to be acceptable for such parents even to actively kill such children with the assistance of the medical profession to make sure the killing is done well, that is, to practice infanticide. 
Now don't be misled. There is a kind of compassion expressed in Singer's extended discussion, but it is not a compassion that is directed at the child with Down syndrome. On the contrary, it is directed towards the parents. Singer goes on in his discussion to emphasize the importance of the disappointment of the parents, disappointment brought on by their dashed expectations. They expect to produce and have the medical community help them produce a healthy baby, where health is measured by potential for future achievements. What parent wouldn't want a kind of chess playing, Woody Allen movie going, guitar strumming LeBron James? <laughs> The money spent caring for this child with a disability could be better, better spent on basketball camp for a new, better, more promising child. No doubt the reflection begins with a description of what people with Down syndrome supposedly will never do. If the child with Down syndrome were conceived of as part of our community, these difficulties mentioned might be the beginning of a serious reflection on how we might, with the assistance of the medical community, aim at healing those conditions that can be healed and assisting to minimize the struggle brought on by those that can't be healed. However, in this discussion, the child is not considered part of the community. He or she is not a patient. In fact, she's an illness, a pathology. The parents are the patients. But it's not even the mother's pregnancy that is the focus of the diagnosis and healing the bioethicist is arguing for. The illness that is being diagnosed is failed expectations for future greatness. Again, the parent's health is being judged by a standard of achievement, their ability to produce a certain sort of high achieving child valued in this culture. The suffering is sorrow at one's inability to have, achi to have achieved what one wanted and what society wants from them. So notice, it's not even really about what the child with Down syndrome may never achieve. At its heart, it's about what the parents have already failed to achieve. A science fiction reading, guitar strumming, chess playing, LeBron James. The standard of health is achievement, and the medical profession should be devoted to healing our failure to be all we can be. By killing the pathology, the medical profession can alleviate the illness that is the failure on its part and on the part of the parents to be high achievers. Although occasioned by the phenomenon of children with Down syndrome, this famous passage captures very well the sentiment that animates much of the contemporary bioethical discussion of illness generally. Many philosophers have noted that most of the arguments employed in bioethics to manage the killing of prenatally diagnosed children are only arbitrarily directed to life in the womb before birth and actually extend to the lives of children even up to two years after birth. There's a kind of cultural squeamishness that is acknowledged about killing a human being to whom we have grown attached and allowed into our moral community of concern. So many will suggest that it would be best to do the killing before six months or so if one wants to avoid this squeamishness. But that addresses a cultural fact and is not a philosophical argument. Formally speaking, the arguments extend beyond two years and throughout the life of the person with the illness or disability. This is why many uh, people with disabilities object to this whole field. They say, what does it say about us? Even people with Down syndrome say, what does this say about us? Consider the argument about future harm done to possible but actually unconceived children. If anything, that particular argument has more force after birth than before. The consumption of resources devoted to caring for the child with a disability is real after birth and throughout life, not simply imaginatively projected before birth. If the parents conceive another child, the continued existence of the child with the illness long after his or her birth is an ever-present harm to the new, presumably healthy child because the child with a disability is depriving the other child of resources that could help him or her achieve his or her greatness. What I've said so far is focused upon the beginning of life, but the attitudes expressed within this contemporary discussion can and are also seen in questions about the end of life as well. So just two years ago, 
An article appearing in a bioethics journal drew an extraordinary amount of attention beyond the typical audience of bioethicists and medical professions. By arguing for what the authors called the importance of afterbirth abortion, what was interesting about this article was that it did not actually break any new ground in the philosophical arguments for killing in abortion, infanticide, or euthanasia. It took the moral legitimacy of these medical acts as, a firmly, established, as firmly established within the community of bioethical scholarship. What it argued for was a change in linguistic practice. The authors argued that we need to stop using words such as infanticide and euthanasia when talking about killing disabled children because of the stigma suffered by the parents and medical profession, professionals who do the killing and are said to have committed infanticide. You see, these words have an unfortunate, this is what the authors argue, this isn't me. These words have an unfortunate cultural relevance in the 21st century because of the historical accident of World War II and the association with the eugenicist programs of National Socialism with its judgments about life not worthy of life. The eugenicist programs that, to be honest, started in the United States. Parents and medical professionals suffer from the stigma of the words. So again, we can alleviate suffering by a shift of language to use a term that nowadays does not have those negative associations, namely abortion. In the view of the authors, because no one any longer suffers a stigma for having or performing an abortion, and because there's no morally significant difference between abortion, infanticide, and euthanasia, all being morally legitimate acts to design, designed to alleviate suffering, in the best healing traditions of the medical profession, infanticide and euthanasia ought to be given the honorific title of abortion, of after birth abortion. This, of course, is a cultural argument, not a philosophical argument. If you think I'm being overly dramatic by emphasizing this culture of healing advocated by the community of bioethicists, consider the government of Denmark announcing a couple of years ago that by the year 2050, it expects through prenatal diagnosis and abortion to have healed Down syndrome. Think about that for a moment. What does it mean to heal Down syndrome? Healed downed Down syndrome. It can't mean that it will have found a way of preventing the genetic mutation that leads to the extra chromosome. As my wife points out, this healing will only last until another child with Down syndrome is conceived. Then it will have to be healed again, and again, and again, and again. But what exactly is being healed here? The culture. The existence of people with Down syndrome is taken to be a pathology in the culture. Danish culture will be healed of Down syndrome because if they are successful, there will be no men, women, or children with Down syndrome living within that community, much the way in most parts of the world polio has been healed with only a few people left who have the scars of it. Of course, polio wasn't healed by killing human beings who suffered from it. That was a vaccine. But here, healing and culture go hand in hand by killing. The culture is a culture of achievement in which human beings are judged to be worthy members of the community and subject to our healing concern insofar as they are capable of moderate to great achievements and judged to be unworthy members, indeed pathological members, insofar as they fall short of this standard of achievement. These unworthy human beings are pathologies that the culture suffers from and must be healed of. Now, I wasn't, strictly speaking, asked to speak to you about the killing of children before or after birth or the killing of the elderly. My doing so last year occasioned this invitation, I believe, and I've done, um, I've done so here because I think it poses a clear way, it proposes a clear way into thinking about healing and culture in two strikingly different ways. We've already seen one way. A culture that measures the worth or dignity of human beings by their potential for achievement. Underachieving human beings are an illness within a culture. An illness, it is the task of medicine to heal. When we look around at our broad Western culture, do we have any real doubt that it is obsessed with achievement and success? 
and that such obsession permeates almost every element of culture, from parenting to sports to education and to medicine. I can certainly confess my own faults in this regard when I think of the way I have at times pushed my children in their upbringing. And oh, when college application time comes around. Watch out. My kids run away when it's time to apply for colleges. Not out of the house. <laughs> in the house. So, in the words of Walker Percy, every j'accuse is equally a mea culpa. Now, I am unapologetically pro-life in the ordinary sense of the term, from womb to tomb. One unfortunate side effect of our cultural politics is that Christians who are pro-life in the ordinary sense of the term are often accused of not caring for anything other than the baby in the womb, not for the woman who is pregnant, her husband, or family, and not for the child after it is born. This accusation may be true of this or that individual, and may well have been true of me in various stages of my life. So again, every j'accuse is equally a mea culpa. However, given the extraordinary extent of social services provided by the Christian community that is the church, its hospitals, schools, adoption agencies, soup kitchens, financial assistance programs, women's care centers, charitable clothing and household goods services, and so on, this accusation cannot be truthfully laid at the door of the church and the culture it nourishes. By and large, it's just a false charge. But it's false in an interesting way that draws attention to what I think is a second, quite different way of thinking of healing and culture that is inseparable from the topic of liturgy. The church thinks of culture thinks of a culture of healing in ways quite different from the way our broader culture increasingly tends to think of it. The bioethical issues I just rehearsed raise these differences in particularly striking ways, but I think the difference permeates medicine in our culture. We live in an individualist culture. I'm not surprising anybody in here, I think, by saying that. We live in an individualist culture that increasingly commodifies everything and everyone. Everything becomes a product in a market of buying and selling, and this includes medicine. The only thing we can agree on is the price we are willing to pay for objects, although in the case of healthcare, we know there's a good deal of disagreement about just what that price is and who will pay it. I won't bore you with a long story taken from the history of modern philosophy as to how we've gotten where we are in our commodified materialist and individualist culture but there are some salient markers to be mentioned. First, there's the goal of producing autonomous rational agents capable of making free choices independent of limiting conditions of any sort. Stated abstractly, this is a good thing to a certain extent. We should be free and autonomous agents. Stated abstractly. However, it may also disfigure our lives together because of the attitude it inculcates about our dependence upon one another. If we are going to be such agents, we need to be free of the conditions that surround us, that limit our capacity to act rationally and autonomously. Among those conditions are social structures that impose certain conceptions of human goodness and happiness upon us from our earliest days of life. So the moder motto of modern enlightened culture is to dare to think for yourself apart from all influence of authoritarian teaching. But any teaching of its very nature must be conceived of as authoritarian, since it relies upon the authority of another to communicate some truth or other to us. The two greatest philosophers of the modern age, Descartes and Kant, and I'm hoping if you went to a Catholic school you had philosophy classes and there's some memory of Descartes and Kant or if you went to a non-Catholic school. The two greatest philosophers of the modern age, Descartes and Kant, both in their own way uh, suggest that we can only be rational and autonomous agents when we throw out what Kant calls the yoke of tutelage. And Descartes says the very first thing you have to doubt, if you remember his method of doubt, the very first thing you have to doubt if you're going to become rational is anything you've ever been taught. Being taught is limits you. 
Other conditions that limit our autonomy have to do with the embodied character of our existence. Free and responsible agency is about rationality and the autonomy of the will, and yet quite often the conditions of our bodies, either because of some disability or some episodic illness, make it impossible for us to pursue unconditioned rationality and autonomy of the will. But it's not just illness and disability that condition our autonomous agency. It's the very character of embodiment itself. As bodily human beings, we are by nature weak, dependent members of an animal species who have to rely upon one another if we're going to survive, much less flourish. Even if we suffer no illness, because of our bodily existence, it is next to impossible to achieve independence of others in pursuit of our autonomous freedom. And yet technology can help. As we've increasingly mastered the world of nature around us by technologi technological <coughs> means, so too we have increasingly turned that technological mastery upon our own bodies. And medicine has increasingly become concerned not simply with healing things that we suffer from, but with producing better and better bodies as we would have them. Not the bodies we are born with, but the bodies we can create. We might say that our embodiment itself has come to be seen as a kind of pathology for our life of rationality and mastery of the will as human agents, a pathology from which technological medicine can heal us. <clears throat> Doctors are the engineers we hire to implement the blueprints of our existence as we have designed them, as we have designed it. Finally, because of the emphasis upon freeing ourselves of the conditions that limit us, conditions into which we are born without the exercise of reason or the consent of our wills, you can see how a model of human achievement as the measure of human dignity and worth naturally arises. You show your worth, your dignity, by your capacity to overcome by reason and will what would otherwise limit you. That requires healthy capacity for achievement. It's not just that you are tall and strong. It's that you are LeBron James, an extraordinarily intelligent and skilled basketball player making all the right choices at all the right times, provided your leg doesn't cramp up. <laughs> you show your dignity, your worth, by what you are capable of achieving in overcoming the limits of embodied creaturely existence. And so the measure of human dignity becomes the exercise of reason and will. But human dignity for us is simply a way of talking about those whom we choose to include within the moral community of concern as worthy of having their lives protected and promoted. Thus, those who suffer from cognitive disabilities that limit their exercise of reason are particularly susceptible of being excluded from the moral community. This is an extraordinarily oversimplified painting I've drawn of our modern culture, particularly our modern Western culture. But just stop for a moment and consider just how Western and bourgeois Peter Singer's judgment was of what children with Down syndrome won't be able to do. And how that Western and bourgeois portrait of the lives of others expresses a culture that would heal by killing those who through some disability or illness have no chance of overcoming the conditions into which they are born before they can reason and without their consent. Well, <clears throat> I'm old enough, and I look around here, and I think there's some others who are old enough. I'm not old enough to remember the song Deacon Blue by Steely Dan from the 1970s. They give a name to the winners of the world. I want a name when I lose. They call Alabama the Crimson Tide call me Deacon Blue. I also remember hearing an awful lot of rock music in mass when I was a kid in the 70s. I confess that I never heard that particular one. <laughs> but maybe it would have been good piped into the confessional. I want a name when I lose. I think from the very beginning the church has approached human dignity, moral concern, and healing in a way quite different from the way the broader culture we live in within now does. Fundamentally, the church, at its best, approaches healing sacramentally and liturgically. I don't know how well you can see that. That's by a Russian 
um, uh, artist called Raoul uh, Mamadov. And everyone, it's after uh, Rembrandt, of course, and, or Da Vinci. Da Vinci. And uh, Rembrandt. The Last Supper. Last Supper, yeah. Da Vinci. Rem da Vinci. Sorry. <laughs> if it's not in my text, I can't keep it. <laughs> and every figure, including Judas and Christ, has Down syndrome. When people first see that, some people object to it because they think it's mocking religion. But that's, of course, the inability to actually understand religion. At least, Christ. Okay, now all of a sudden, those of you who were wondering in the secret depths of your mind why I was asked to address you, you might suddenly have had the thought, hello, what's that? What did he say? I'll repeat it. The church understands healing sacramentally and liturgically. If you check your Oxford English Dictionary, which I tell my students never to do when they're writing a paper, <laughs> if you check your Oxford English Dictionary online, you'll see that in ancient Greece it meant at Athens, a public office or duty which the richer citizens discharged at their own expense. That's probably familiar in this crowd. And as you know, the early history of the church involved taking care of those who suffered, the poor, the sick, the hungry. The absurdity of the claim that being pro-life means only caring about the child in the womb and no one else is made manifest by reading the history of the Christian church. The service of healing was by and large not a public office of the political community, which quite often did little along those lines. It was a public office of the church, discharged at its own expense. So at least in that sense of the term, from the Oxford, Dic Oxford Dictionary, it was liturgical. But in saying that the church thinks of healing in the context of medicine liturgically, I don't mean simply to make a play on words as if it's an accidental coincidence that we refer to the sacraments as liturgical and, the medical, and, medical heal and that medical healing is a public service that has always been a part of the life of the church. I do actually intend to suggest that the church's public liturgical service of healing body and soul in hospitals, schools, soup kitchens, charitable organizations, and so on, is directly related to, indeed flows out of, Christ's liturgical act of healing, made present to us in the sacraments. Christ heals within us the image of God, which was damaged by sin but never completely lost. And in his image, we turn to the world to offer it what healing we can because we see in it the image of God in those who suffer. In older days, before let it be and stairway to heaven could be heard at the elevation, these were called the works of mercy, or better, the opera misericordiae. So I want now to finish, it might take me a little while still, but to, to come to the last part of the paper, I want now to turn to misericordia, whom we are taught is a person by that wonderful hymn. Maybe you'll sing it with me. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulcedo, Et Spes Nostra Salve. A Te Clamamus, Exules Fili, In hoc lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo, advocata nostra, illos tuos, misericordes oculos, ad nos converte. Et Jesu, Benedictum fructum ventris tuis, nobis post hoc exilium ostende. O 
place of admission. <laughs> this hymn tells us that Mary is the mother of Misericordia. She mothers Misericordia to us when she offers us her son. Misericordia is a person. I said I didn't want to bore you with a philosophical history of our modern predicament. Now I fear I'm going to bore you with Thomas Aquinas on the virtue of misericordia and what might appear to be an arcane medieval theological question. The question was cur deus homo. Why did God become a human being? Many medieval theologians held that even if there had been no fall of Adam and Eve, God would have become incarnate in Christ, Jesus, because in a way God entering into his creation would fulfill and complete it. Thomas Aquinas disagreed. In the first place, he didn't like the suggestion of imposing a necessity upon God, which it would seem he would be under if the incarnation was necessary to complete creation. In the second place, he opposed it mostly for biblical reasons. Citing the Easter liturgy, O Felix Culpa, he argued that the entire weight of biblical evidence stands in favor of the incarnation being a response to the fall, not a completion of creation. To be sure, he thought God could have become incarnate without the fall. But in fact, he became incarnate because of the fall. But that response then raises another question. If the incarnation is God's response to the fall, did God have to become incarnate to respond to the fall? Couldn't he have responded to the fall in some other way? In effect, this becomes a question as to whether we could have been forgiven and satisfaction been made for our injustice without God becoming a human being in Jesus Christ. Again, Aquinas tells us there's no necessity to the incarnation. To say Christ had to become incarnate to respond to our sin looks like the imposition of another sort of necessity upon God. On the contrary, God could have forgiven us our transgression and satisfaction been made for us without Christ's incarnation death and resurrection. But that just brings us back to our original arcane medieval theological question, cur deus homo. Why did God become a human being if it was not necessary to complete creation and it was not necessary for our salvation? It is in fact how we are saved, but it is not necessary that we be saved in that way. The answer is misericordia. Unfortunately, the English term mercy doesn't really translate the Latin misericordia very well. Mercy, as we use it, is often associated with the activity of a judge. A judge acts mercifully when he or she forgives some aspect of punishment that has been justly imposed upon a wrongdoer. Recall Portia in The Merchant of Venice when she says, The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. She's pleading that the prince forgive the pound of flesh that Antonio owes to Shylock. But the prince cannot forgive it because Shylock does not forgive it. Shylock will have his bond. This sense of mercy is bound to and exists within the confines of justice. Aquinas calls this judicial mercy clementia or clemency. But to see what misericordia is and why it isn't what we mean by the mercy of a judge, we have to understand how misericordia goes beyond justice without violating it. Of course God forgives us of the justly imposed punishment we are due for our transgressions. So he does extend to us clemency or mercy in the sense of a judge. But we've already seen that Aquinas thinks mercy in the sense of judicial forgiveness, clemency, could have been extended to us without the incarnation. God certainly forgives us in his incarnation, death, and resurrection. But we do not call Mary the mother of forgiveness. I don't think. I'm not familiar with a hymn. We call her Mater Misericordiae. Misericordia goes beyond justice and forgiveness because it extends healing. Forgiveness when we have been wronged may be a first step toward healing. But forgiveness itself is not healing, as we see in the case of a just judge, who may forgive a punishment, but in his forgiveness does not heal the one who has been forgiven. And the healing that is the fruit of misericordia springs from companionship or friendship. 
If you'll allow me, God's liturgical act, his public service springing from his wealth, goes beyond his forgiveness. It heals. What his liturgical act heals is our friendship with God, made as we are images of God, destined for what Aquinas calls our companionship in beatitude with God. When Thomas talks about misericordia as a virtue, he inherits a discussion from the Greek philosophers. Their discussion involved the Greek term eleos, which we have in uh, Kyrie eleison. The term that shows up in Luke's gospel when Christ asks the scholar of the law who it was that was neighbor to the man who had been set upon by thieves. The scholar of the law says the man of eleos. Notice in this moment that the scholar of the law can be seen to represent the order of justice. But he acknowledges something more and beyond justice, or the, or the law, when he acknowledges eleos, which is translated in the Vulgate as the man of misericordia. Christ commands him, the man of the law, to do other and more than justice. He commands him to live misericordia. Etymologically, misericordia means a suffering heart. The Greeks recognize that we are often pained when we see others suffering. They thought this happens because we see the other as like ourselves, and we fear that a similar suffering may befall us. But this Greek notion grounded in fear for oneself doesn't capture the gospel sense of eleos that we see in the Good Samaritan. The Samaritan does not fear for himself. On the contrary, he is pained by the suffering of the man on the road. Nothing suggests he feels fear. If anything, the other, the other two were the ones who feared, not the Good Samaritan. So the, the Samaritan does not, uh, sorry. Nothing suggests he feels fear. On the contrary, he experiences compassion. Etymologically, compassion means suffering with. So the Samaritan suffers with the man on the road. And then he acts to alleviate the man's suffering. He acts to heal him. The Greek notion of eleos did not involve suffering with others. It involves suffering out of fear for oneself upon the occasion of others' suffering. Most importantly, it did not involve a virtue by which one would act to alleviate suffering prompted by compassion. Now, when Aquinas talks about misericordia, which is the Latin translation for eleos, he acknowledges this Greek sense of fear for oneself among the philosophers. And he even suggests that one will often act to help others, prompted by this fear for oneself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You too might someday suffer in this way, and you would want aid in your suffering. But Aquinas then goes beyond this kind of aid motivated by fear for oneself. He goes beyond it when he introduces the notion of friendship, into the discussion of misericordia. Compassion need not be motivated by fear. It is often motivated by friendship. We grieve when we see our friends suffering, whether or not we fear for ourselves. We rejoice with them that rejoice, and we weep with them that do weep. In that friendship, we act to help our friends, to assist them, to heal them. But who is my friend? Who is my neighbor? The Good Samaritan acts because he sees the man on the road as his friend. We know this because he does not simply help the man and then move on. He tells the innkeeper that on his return voyage he will stop by and check in on the man to see how he was doing and will continue to assist him. Misericordia is ongoing and does not end because it springs not from fear for oneself but from friendship with those who suffer. And the man on the road is every man who suffers. What then of the incarnation? Recently, Pope Francis has drawn our attention to misericordia by choosing it for the motto of his pontificate. He even quotes St. Thomas in the joy of the gospel, <coughs> quotes him from the passage I've been summarizing for you. The Pope quotes Thomas saying that misericordia is the greatest of all virtues, considered in itself greater even than caritas because it is the most godlike of virtues. When we manifest misericordia in our lives, we manifest the image of God within us. 
Had God merely forgiven us as a just judge does, he would not have suffered with us. Judges do not and should not weep for the condemned when they forgive them. Had God merely forgiven us like a just judge, he would not have wept. And yet we know that Jesus wept. Once over Jerusalem, the other time before he healed Lazarus by raising him from the dead. God in Jesus Christ weeps because he suffers with us. And it is important that he suffers in his humanity, not his divinity. Divine suffering would not be compassion. Suffering with us. To suffer with us, God must become human, must become incarnate. And in Christ's suffering, genuinely human suffering becomes the vehicle of divine love in his liturgical act. It's not prompted by a divine fear, whatever that might be. It's prompted by divine friendship. God's friendship for us answers the arcane medieval theological question, per Deus homo. Why did God become a human being? Because he first loved us. In that friendship, he chooses to suffer with us. Suffering with us, he acts to heal our suffering. The incarnation is more than and beyond the mercy of a judge forgiving our transgressions. The incarnation is the healing act of a friend. And because Christ's compassion, his suffering with us, is truly human, human compassion itself becomes the vehicle of divine love. But that means that our compassion, our misericordia, can also be the vehicle of divine love. As we know, Catholics and their opera misericordiae are at times accused of thinking that they can buy their salvation through good works. However, Seen through the eyes of incarnate misericordia, it becomes clear that the opera misericordia, misericordiae are simply the overflowing extension of Christ's ongoing liturgical act of healing in the world brought about by those who live and move and have their being in the friendship of Christ. We should not seek out suffering. That would be masochistic. But we should seek out those who suffer and befriend them. When we do that and act to help those who suffer, we truly manifest the image of God within us. And our acts become the vehicle of divine love like Christ's before us and Christ's in us. We love because he first loved us. Turn your attention back for a moment to that other culture of healing that looks to manufacture outstanding exemplars of human achievement and sees those who suffer disability and illness as pathologies within the culture needing to be cured when it resorts to killing. Do we see friendship there? Certainly not friendship for those who are suffering disability or illness. For how does friendship kill if it first adopts the suffering of the friend as one's own? Is, friendship, uh, is it friendship that tells a mother or a father to kill their child or their parent, having adopted their suffering as one's own? Do we suffer with them as friends when we judge them to have failed in producing a good basketball player and advise them to kill the living reminder of their failure? Or doesn't friendship require that we live with them, adopting their troubles as our own and helping them to live and love the lives that have been given to them? There are very good reasons why medical professionals have to retain a certain psychological distance from those they assist. We should be thankful for them and that they do not burn out from a too close association with those they help. And yet, the alternative cannot be a culture in which the care they extend to those who suffer is just one more commodity in the market of commodities to be bought and sold. iMacs, iPads, iPods, iPhones, and eye doctors. <laughs> At this point, I'm coming to an end, so I thought I should lighten up a bit. <laughs> what we must do is assist their service to life by embedding what they do within a culture of life, which is another, nothing other than a culture of friendship in beatitude, made present by Christ's liturgical act of healing. And that culture of life begins when we ourselves participate, when we ourselves participate in Christ's liturgical act of healing made present to us in the sacraments. We can't have a culture of life in the world without 
the life of the sacraments in our lives. What do you in these days together, what you do in these days together reflecting upon liturgy and healing is important among other reasons because it is Christ's liturgical act of healing that shows us the way to heal the suffering world around us. Friendship has no price. It cannot be bought. It cannot be sold. It can only be offered. There's no better way for us to understand that fact than to look upon the face of divine friendship, the misericordia that Mother marries to us. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. Thank you. We have some time for question and comments. Acts of friendship. Yes. Uh, though I'm not a linguistic scholar, I've heard that both Eleos and Misericordia are translations of the Hebrew chesed, which means covenant love. Could you talk about the relationship with uh, this idea of covenant love and friendship uh, with regard to healing? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think there'd be a historical question there as to the root of the Greek. Um, that would be one. But in terms of, I think, um, uh, biblical translations, uh, I've read that as well, um, that that would be the way in which it's translated. There's a theologian here at Notre Dame, Gary Anderson, who just wrote a really wonderful book on charity um, and uh, looking at the uses of, uh, of Eleos and then what the Hebrew um, would be in the Old Testament um, uh, and going through any number of, of accounts. Uh, what's interesting, I've talked to him about this, is the one account in Scripture that he doesn't do uh, is the Good Samaritan, um, which uses it. But I think, um, the, I mean, this is where it is kind of really not a brag that I'm not a theologian. I'm a little worried in trying to answer questions about covenant love, except insofar as I talk about my own family. Um, uh, friendship, uh, friendship, of course, binds us to one another. And as a philosopher, um, I do like Greek philosophy despite its failure. Um, to do what it wanted to do. But um, uh, one of the ways in which friendship is characterized by, say, Aristotle, is that you adopt the good of the other as your own. It becomes, a, it becomes integral to your own good. And not as my good, but it remains as your, your good, right, is my good, and so on. And I think that's kind of the highest form of friendship, and, and, and it sort of binds you. There's a way in which you, you cease to have a good if you are not uh, faithful to that kind of uh, act of making the good of the other your own. And I think that is what, uh, again, I can be corrected by the theologians in the room. I mean, that's the great story of, of Revelation, is, is the covenant that God makes with the people of Israel and, and the restoration of that covenant and the faithfulness to that covenant, even to, um, in the Christian understanding, the incarnation. He, he doesn't remain distant. I mean, he adopts the suffering as his own. And that's the kind of interesting parallel there, is if friendship requires that one adopt the good of one of, of the other as one's own, as integral now, necessary to me, that this person flourish and, and, and so on. In a way, what Aquinas is saying, or I'm suggesting, is you can't do that unless you're willing to make the suffering of your friend your own. You can't be a friend without it's, it, simply by saying, oh, it's their good. Because, of course, their suffering is related to their good. And the larger picture here is that the good of all of us is to live a certain life amongst one another as friends with God as, as the core of that friendship, living, um, loving God and others in God, caritas. So um, I'm, I'm not sure that I can answer that particular um, scriptural question. I suspect Professor Fagerberg probably could be, and he's already been put up as the authority. But does that, I mean, I think it's, I think it's this kind of, again, um, sense that um, it's not good enough to have a covenant where 
everything's good, right? The covenant means being with those who suffer, and that that's exemplified um, in the incarnation. It's an act of the covenant, as far as I can tell. Bourbon and wait. Well, thank you for listening. You. Um, yeah. I, as again, I'm, I'm very <laughs> honored to have been, uh, asked to. I'm honored to have been asked to address you, since what you do affects my life at least weekly and sometimes more often. <laughs>